Okay, church, turn with me to Romans 12. We are in a new section this morning as we move on from spiritual gifts to verse 9. And uh, before we dig into the word, let us go, Lord, in prayer. Lord, we, that song resonates with our hearts. Lord, how wonderful and how marvelous your love as you displayed it on the cross, shed your blood, the creator dying for his creation. Lord, coming into our broken world. And Lord, solving our problem of sin so that someday we can all sing, O oh, death, where is your sting? So Lord, we praise you, Lord, because you have won that victory through your great love for us. And we are amazed because we are undeserving of that love so often throughout our lives, and yet you pour it onto us. Lord, as we dig into Romans 12, Starting in verse 9, Lord, may we have a passion to live for your glory. Lord, open up our eyes to see things the way you see it. To see this world the way you see it. In your name, amen. So I titled this sermon, Christians Fight. And as I was singing these songs, there's another thing that was just kind of emotional for me because... Um, one of the last things, my the last thing that my dad said to uh, Tommy and Joy as they had to go back early um, from being with him was he told Tommy he knew that Tommy might be going to a school that may be a little more liberal. Uh, my cousin went to this school, got into drugs really bad, so there's a little bit of a fear there. Uh, and 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 he said, he said, Tommy, you have to fight. You have to fight for your faith. Pretty much, don't become apathetic. Fight, fight the good fight. And that was probably the best blessing that he could have given um, to my kids. So Christians fight. The reason why I title that this way is because uh, the, the, the rest of Romans 12 is really like a playbook for how to fight the good fight. How do we fight the spiritual battle and not become apathetic? So Romans 12 just reading verse 9 this morning, I wanted to get down into verse 10 this morning, but it would have been a long sermon, and I know that uh, I would have lost some people probably. So we're going to focus just on verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. This text is the um, exact opposite of apathy. It is a text encouraging, it, verse, one verse, encouraging us to live passionately for Christ. All that God has done for us, and remember Romans 12, therefore, beginning of Romans 12, because of all that Christ has done for us, let us then be genuine with our love, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. And I would say, church, that probably the greatest enemy of the American church is apathy. We could say, well, what about sexual perversion? What about all of the problems in our country that seem to be just kind of, you know, drowning out the, the, the walk that we have with Christ that are just pervasive? What about all these other sinful issues? And I would say that if we are passionate for Christ, those issues won't mess with us. But when we become apathetic in our walk with the Lord, we become attacked by the enemy. We are then just sitting ducks. We don't have our guard up. I don't know why that phrase is even used, by the way, sitting ducks, because, man, when my ducks sit and sleep, they don't, they don't miss anything. It's like they sleep with one eye open. I try to sometimes see if I can sneak up on them. There's no way. So that sitting ducks thing is just a weird phrase, but um, nevertheless, we become like that. We are just... We are just uh, not being watchful, not being wise, not realizing that we are in a fight, a fight against evil. And the reason why I say the American church struggles with this so much is because we are just so blessed. We don't have like persecution in our face physically. It's more under the surface. It's more creeping around all the time and we just don't recognize it. And we have all of these distractions that, that, that can 
create apathy. Sometimes good things, blessings that can become distractions in our life. You know, even our songs, our songs sing of apathetic type living. Like in 1968, the song was popular and it's still very popular today. And I actually like the song. Like sometimes when I'm sitting out by my pond, I, I sing the song in my head. And if you really go through all the lyrics, you're like, yeah, but it's kind of messed up. It's sitting by the dock of the bay. You know that song? Watching the tide roll away. You guys know that one? The the line that is just sad is, I've got nothing to live for. Seem like nothing's going to come my way. Man, that's sad. that's, That's kind of the American dream. To store up enough wealth that you can just go sit by the dock of the bay. 10,000 miles I roam just to make this dock my home. Like, I, I've been searching for something, and i found really nothing, nothing to live for. That is apathy. But so many live that way. I heard a, I was watching a documentary. I like documentaries. When you get old, for some reason, you watch documentaries more. My son, Dad, you watching another documentary? It was, it was about, uh, the one episode was about ga- gaming and, and it was like the internet, how dangerous the internet is. And uh, this gamer, she said this, if real life isn't making me feel good and playing video games is, then I'm just going to do this. Like, she was talking about how she's just not happy with life. And so this is an escape. And some of you guys, your youth that are maybe gamers, like to game a lot. Man, why'd you throw me under the bus like that? My mom is not going to let me play another game today. Uh, I'll say this. That is a lot of things. TV, binge watching TV. You know, like, if we indulge into entertainment because our life is maybe boring, so we gotta, we got to focus on this, and that's where we get our purpose, that's where we get our joy Something isn't quite right. So I encourage you, young people, and I know what, you know, I used to play, you know, back in college. I'd play Halo until I, my eyes hurt. So I know what that's like, wasting that time. And then the next day, you're like, man, why'd I do that? I, I was up too late, you know. I didn't get anything accomplished. And that was the Holy Spirit in me being like, you need to just tone it down on the video games. And then once I got married and had a child, that was over with. Tried to bring the video games back. and My boys were getting of that age and just had fun beating them in Halo, reliving my Halo days. And I'd go to church, I'd come back home, and then they were like better than me. I was like, forget this, I'm not playing this anymore. But that's an example of how we as Christians have these distractions in our life that keep us apathetic This text is the opposite of apathy. It's exploding with passion and pursuit of what is right and good. So pursue what is right and good. It is interesting that our fleshly desire to be lazy and apathetic, it's a desire of our flesh. But do you know that that desire wars against our soul's desire to find meaning and purpose and to enjoy adventure and to fight the good fight of life? Deep down, we want that, all of us, but our fleshly desire of laziness will war against that. And if we feed it, it will take over. And we will be sitting by the dock of the bay having nothing to live for. So how do we fight against that? This is our our playbook, church, Romans 12, 9. If you just read through all of this, just let's do that real quick. We're going we're gonna to focus. We're going to come back to focus on verse 9. But I wanted to just read through this. And maybe every Sunday we just need to read through this. Notice the passion. Notice the challenging way of living that this is talking about. The way of living that I think all of us deep in our souls want. Even unbelievers who have the law written on their hearts, I think, could read this and go, ah, that's good. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. 
love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. You wanna be competitive? Be competitive that way. Be somebody that wants to show honor more than anyone else. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not become o- overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What an awesome text that we get to focus on for the upcoming weeks. It's, we're going to take some time getting through this. That is passionate living. A, a type of life that truly will be salt and light in this world, as our Savior talked about. So, first things first. First things first. Love must be sincere. It must be genuine. Apathetic living will train you. Listen to this. I should have put this quote up there. Apathetic living will train you how to be insincere and pretend that you love someone when you really don't care. That's apathetic. I still want to be polite. I still want to look good, but I really don't care about anyone else. Sincere love, in fact, this word love is the the strongest form that that can be used for the word love in the Greek. It's agape. So let agape be sincere. Agape is that unconditional, like, I will give up myself for you because I love you. I'll give of my time my energy, and I will pursue other people with a 1 Corinthians 13 type of love. That's agape, define. So may we love with that kind of love. Politeness reflects on me. Love is about the other. Let me give you a, let me give you a story just to kind of explain what I mean by politeness. Because I think we all, I mean, we want our kids to be polite. I want to be polite. I don't want to be a rude person. Um, but it's pretty easy to do that. And you can learn how to do that even when you really don't have a deep love for people. Okay. I was at a funeral not too long ago, embarrassingly, and I was officiating this funeral. And um, I was busy, and I was, getting, I was, I was in a hurry. Well, I, I didn't zip my zipper up. And it was one of those, those pants that just, for some reason, just out this way. And it was a very hot day. So... No warning signs, no breeze, no draft, just, just going to the field. I mean, I don't know how long this happened, but these are a lot of people that I didn't know very well, and there was a couple people that I knew. Thankfully, somebody finally came up to me before I got up and actually officiated the wedding. Or the, why do I say that? Wedding. Ugh. Wedding and funeral. I get those because officiating. Oh, anyhow, I was officiating the funeral. Before I did that, somebody came to me and said, hey, Pastor zippers down. Well, thankfully, that person was willing to go past the awkwardness to address that with me. That's care. He's caring about me, right? And I guarantee you a lot of people didn't say anything because they didn't want the awkward conversation. They didn't want to be rude, so they didn't say anything. You see, that's kind of the difference between polite and real love. Real love cares so much about the person that they're willing to go past the awkwardness and really have maybe a tough conversation with them if needed. And so that is the difference. Love, let love be a sincere kind of love where you truly care about that other person as much as you care about yourself. Love your neighbor as what? 
yourself. And so treat other people that way. Man, if we do that, it will change how we live. It'll make us uncomfortable a lot of the time because it takes sacrifice. Then he says this, abhor what is evil. Hate what is evil. How do we do that? Like, I think that's another thing in our culture that we are not taught to do. Don't hate what is evil. Live and let live. Just live your life. Let other people live their life. But really, living and let living, as the song goes, is really living and let dying. Because you can't just go about life and not deal with some of the problems in this world as a believer when you have the answer and think that it's going to go okay. Because it's not. So don't live and let live. Live and pursue life. Live and pursue right. Hate what is evil. I saw this quote by uh, someone posted this on Facebook this last week, and I was like, ooh, I really like that quote. If you stay silent and fail to rock the boat in this war between good and evil, your life might be easier, but your children's won't. It will creep into your own heart, evil will. It will creep into your own home, your family. It is around, it lurks, and the enemy is seeking to destroy. And you can look at history and see examples of this. When good men do nothing, evil thrives. When sickness is allowed to continue without dealing with it, bad things follow. Bad things follow. That's actually in The Hobbit. I quoted The Hobbit there. In the, the first Hobbit, there's this, there's this dwarf king, and he is obsessed with his gold. And, and, it, and it's, he describes it this way, that it's like a sickness of the mind. And where sickness thrives, bad things follow. And then the dragon comes, and they are then pushed out of their homes and people die and terrible things happen. It's a beautiful picture, um, Tolkien, beautiful writing of how life happens when we don't fight the good fight that God's calling us to fight. And it starts in our own mind, church. It starts in our own heart. Nobody knows what's going on in your mind. Only you and God. And so we are told to hate what is evil. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14 is one of my favorite passages for men especially, but this applies to women as well. Be watchful. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Don't be apathetic. Be watchful. The enemy prowls around like a roaring lion. So, so fight the good fight. Put on your armor. Pursue what is good and hate what is evil because evil kills. It destroys human life in every way. Evil kills human life physically. It kills human life socially. It kills human life mentally and spiritually. That's what evil is. It is corruption. It is corruption of the worst degree. But often... The enemy, through our flesh, lures us through that evil. Lures us. Just a little taste. Just a little taste. It'll, it'll be all right. It's no big deal. I had this at the end of my sermon, but I'm going to use it right now. I think I had this written on my PowerPoint. Spurgeon says this, If the devil comes to you and you get into an argument with him, he will beat you. For he is a very ancient lawyer, and he has been at that business for many ages that you cannot match him. Send him to your advocate. I love that. Send him to your advocate. Meaning, don't sit there and spend time arguing with the enemy when he's tempting you. Don't do that. He will win. Like, flee, pursue what is good, 
Hate what is evil, see the evil for what it is, and don't be thinking that it's not really that bad. That's what he wants you to do. It's, evil is corruption. It's like rust on your car. When you see it, it's like, ah. Uh, it's like, I need to deal with that at some point, or my, my car is going to just rust away. You know, so like when I got my truck, I was all happy because I found a truck that was 2012 and it looked like it had no rust on it whatsoever. And then I was showing my truck to Greg and he works on cars, old cars and restores them. And he, he, uh, he, he pointed out, he said, oh yeah, you got one little, you got to watch that. Wait, 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 what? And there was just this little bump in the paint. And he's like, yeah, that, that's some rust there, man. I'm like, oh. I thought it was rust free. And he's like, the worst part about it is it's like a lot worse under the paint. And I'm like, no. And then I took it through the car wash and it was like, I owned that thing for maybe a month and that piece of paint came off and you can see a little spot of rust and now there's four more spots. It's like, no. And I'm trying to talk like, so how do you deal with this? He's like, well, you could cut the holes like this big of a section out or just replace the whole panel. It's gonna cost me eventually. So that is what sin is. It looks like it's not that big of a deal, but underneath the surface, it's a big deal. And we often don't see it for what it is. Like we think it's not that, oh, it's just one little, one little bump, no big deal. But somebody who really knows their stuff's like, no, it's a big deal. Like it's going to get worse. And that's how the, the Lord is with us. So we go to our advocate, and he points out, no, 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 it's not a little bump. Man, this is, this is going to destroy the whole side of your truck. This is going to destroy your life. And we have certain areas of our life that we seem to think it's not that big of a deal, but it is a cancer inside of us. I hate cancer. And if you allow cancer to thrive, it will destroy. And that is, that is sin. That's what it does. And here's what we're really good at church, because I know I've been very good at this, um, and I have to, the Lord is constantly convicting me on this. Like, we are very good at, like, being disgusted by sins that we don't struggle with, that other people struggle with, but the sin that we struggle with, not that big of a deal. Like, not, like, we, we are very good at, like, explaining that away, and what we need to ask God to help us do is to hate the evil that would entangle us. Hebrews 12, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run this race with perseverance, letting go of the sin that so easily entangles us. Don't you want to run free? Don't you want to be free from that sin that would pull you? And you know what? The sin that entangles you is not the sin that easily is disgusting to you that other people deal with. It's the sin that should be more disgusting and you've allowed it to exist and creep into your life. So send Satan to your advocate. Flee. Abhor it. See it for what it is. See it for what it will do. And then run to Christ and run free. Oh, that we would hate that which is evil. Oh, that we would hate that which we in our flesh enjoy. It, like, oh, that we would run free without that entanglement. And that's why when I read that, I'm like, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, help me to hate what entangles me. Help me to hate that sin that you died for, that your blood was shed so that I could be forgiven. Help me to hate this sin that the enemy would seek to get a foothold in my life and destroy my life. Destroy other people through this, whatever it may be. So how do you defeat evil? Well, you ask God to help you to have a disgust, a distaste for it. Maybe take that sin as far as it could go. Like, where could it take you? What could it do if you allowed it to fester? Like, have your spiritual lens on to where you see the little teeny bump and you actually are able to kind of see past that to what really is happening and what Satan wants to do. 
So give, ask God to give you that lens. And then notice how right after a poor what is evil, it says hold fast to what is good. The good is set against the evil as if to cancel it out. So when we are holding fast to what is good, we are able to more naturally defeat evil. You know, I think I might have shared this before from the pulpit, but I'll share it again. Kind of like if you're like trying not to eat chocolate, maybe you have like, a, I don't know how many of you guys really like chocolate out there. A lot of people really like chocolate. And then they all have their, some people like dark chocolate, some people like milk chocolate, right? And there's all different forms of chocolate. I like chocolate with nuts in it, right? Now, if you're trying, like say you've had like every night, you got into a habit where you just have to have your chocolate. Every night you have your, you indulge in chocolate. And you're starting to notice, like, I'm putting on some pounds here. Like, something needs to stop. So I just need to stop eating chocolate. Well, if you just focus on not thinking about chocolate, milk chocolate, dark chocolate, Hershey's, Reese's, if you just try to focus on not eating it, and you'll start seeing chocolate everywhere. You'll start seeing it in your sleep. Like, that's not the way to deal with it, right? The way to deal with it is to focus on something good that is better for you and love that which is good. Like, I, you know what? When I've been able to replace, like, a bad habit with, like, a good habit, like, you know what? There are ways to eat salad that's really delicious. And some of you are thinking, no. Some of you teenagers are like, no, no, but really, for real. There are ways to doctor up chicken. There are ways to make healthy things delicious. And then you make it a habit, and it becomes something that you really enjoy and you focus on. And that's the same, spiritually speaking. If we would only turn our affections from what is evil, and that we would not just say, yeah, that's good, I should do that, but rather be like, oh, I love that. I cherish that. I want to be that. So let's stir up our affections so that we are loving what is good. And when we are focusing on what is good, the evil is canceled out. So let me give you an example. Anger is a very strong emotion. Now I know that God says in the Bible he's angry, he's angry at sin, he's angry at the corruption in this world, just as you are, you know, a righteous type of anger. But human anger, we are told, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Like without Christ working in us, even when we're angry at something bad, we can often do something bad. Because it's the anger of man. Anger is a strong emotion that is, is actually, from the human standpoint, it's evil. So what do we do? The park this last, um, uh, last night, we had, it was a blessing. We had 80-some people there. And um, Derek and Caroline, they're out of town right now, but they, they served, and a lot, along with many of you, served as well. They, they made the food. They made this wonderful smoked turkey and had a message and um, one guy told me afterwards, he said, man, I, I don't know if I can wait through the whole line because the bus is coming, but man, the, like, I, you really spoke to me. He said, that, that was better than the food. And I was like, oh, man, that was so good to hear. It was so good to hear. Like, that's what we're really there for, the soul food, you know? And one lady came to me afterwards, and she asked me to pray for her. And through tears, she shared with me that she doesn't know how to let go of anger. She's just angry all the time, and, and she notices that a lot of people don't want to be around her because she's angry all the time. So I, I prayed over her. I prayed for her to see the love of God, the peace that comes from God, the fruits of the Spirit to fill her. What do you do when you struggle with wanting vengeance on an enemy or being bitter towards a certain person? How do you, how do you cancel that out? You can't just grow up and be like, I can't be angry. Oh, I got to stop that. I got to, like, that's not it. That's not everything. I, it, when you do feel those anger emotions come up, yes, like, take that thought captive 
as Scripture says. Take it captive and make it obedient to Christ. And the way you make it obedient to Christ is you dwell on the good. And for me, I want to gaze on first Christ and his forgiveness. That while he was betrayed, he took bread and broke it. And, and, and on that cross, the most beautiful statement probably ever muttered from any human mouth, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I have a hard time forgiving people for much less things than that. Like, much less things than that. The bitterness creates anger. And that anger will steal your joy. So I, I, I gaze upon Christ. I, I gaze upon people like Joseph in the Old Testament. There was a type of Christ his life, so much of his life pointed to Christ. And Joseph, when his own brothers who had sold him into slavery, you know, they, they're afraid that Joseph, now that he's in power and their dad is dead, that now, like, Joseph's going to take revenge because dad isn't there anymore. And, like, they are so fearful because it's just natural for humans to get revenge. He's going to get back. I mean, we sold him to slavery. And... and the worst kind of betrayal you can think of, your own flesh and blood, because of their jealousy. And Joseph said, am I in the place to judge? Just like Romans 12 says here, it is God, it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And he says, am I, am I in the place to judge? He said, by the way, what you meant for evil, God used for good for the saving of many lives. And he hugged his brother. I want to gaze upon him. I want to gaze upon other people that I've known, believers throughout history that are my heroes. Who are some of your heroes? Corey Ten Boom is one of mine. Corey Ten Boom. Her, her sister was killed by the Nazis in a concentration camp. Her father was killed by the Nazis in a concentration camp. And after that, she forgave the very guard that was in that concentration camp and fourth, like she said, the will can function without the emotions. Her emotions said she didn't want to, but she knew she needed to because she was being obedient to her Lord who had forgiven her. So she said, I, my will can function without the emotions. And so I held out my hand to this man to forgive him. And as our hands touched, I just started crying and then the emotions followed. Beautiful picture of forgiveness. That, that's like somebody that's like my hero. So I long, I want to be like that. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. It's okay to, to look to believers. Like we ultimately follow Christ, but we can also look to other believers as examples and say, I, I want to I be like that person, man. That person is a beautiful example of Christ. This last week, um, there was somebody who in our community who is a ref, and I know him playing basketball. He refs some of our games. His uh, son was shot and killed here in Decatur. And and this is a second son that was killed in Decatur. He's involved with ministries. I, I, I've done a prayer walk in Decatur. There's a bunch of churches that were involved. Um, it was really cool because it was like in the inner city, and it was very much interdenominational, black, white. Everybody was there. And we did this prayer walk, and this man was there. And you could tell he just has a heart for the city. His second sh son is shot and he was on Facebook Live. And somebody in this church who's not here this morning uh, talked about how that Facebook Live video meant so much to him and then posted about it because he said, here's a man who has lost two sons to gun violence. And that whole Facebook Live video was full of so much love and, and peace. It just blew him away. You know, he said, this is a hard. I remember I watched the video. He said, man, he said, man this is hard. This is a hard, hard time. He said, but, but you know, we got to keep grinding. we got to keep doing good. So I said, I love all you out there. I love all you out there. And then it was cracking me up because he said, somebody still needs to bring, bring me some fried chicken, but I love all you guys out there. But I'm like, I'm like man, that, that, that is something. Like when you see people, I don't even know the guy real well, but I saw that, and I'm like, I, I want to I love life. If he can forgive and be loving and peaceful, Going through that, I can do that just with the little things that hurt me in my life. And maybe there's going to be something big someday. And may I have that heart 
of forgiveness and love. So I hold fast to the good and I stir up my emotions to love that which is good. And then that which is evil is canceled out. And in me, it'd be very easy for me to store up in my flesh, to store up bitterness, to become a, 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 just an a angry person. It's easy to do that. Oh, with my flesh, but it's also easy to let God take over, isn't it? Like we have a good God. He said, my, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. Like, like I, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He's like, I, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So let us pursue Christ. As we sing this last song, it's, uh, it's all about not I, but Christ in me. And so as we pursue what is good, that is how we do it. How do we do it? We pursue these things that are lofty challenges for us. As we go through Romans 12, I hope that it's challenging for you because it's supposed to be that way. I hope that it's growing for you and it's growing for me. And as we do that, we go, Lord, I, I, need, to, I need to pursue you. I need to pursue your goodness and your righteousness because if, if I don't, I, I'm going to really struggle. I'm going to have a hard time being able to do what I really want to do deep down inside. So again, church Christians fight. Fight the good fight. Don't be apathetic. Ask God to, to take off that, that lens of, you know what, there's no physical war going on, but there's a spiritual battle going on, and it's for the souls of mankind. And God wants to use you to be that good soldier for the kingdom of God. And it starts right here and right here in our hearts and in our minds. And it starts with, with loving the good and wanting love to be genuine and not fake and hating what is evil. And ask God to do that in your heart. So as we sing this song, ask God to, to, to form himself in you uh, so that we can be that beautiful bride that shines bright in our community on a daily basis throughout the week as we go about and carry him into this world. Father, oh, how we thank you for your word that speaks to our hearts, that is so needed today, so needed in, in, in my life daily. Lord, I, I truly want to hold fast to the good as if it is my life. Hold fast to that which is my anchor. And as the storms come and the enemy attacks in different ways, that we would be as a church holding so fast to that which is good, that we stand firm for your glory. And you are worthy, Lord Jesus. You are worthy of our all. In your name we pray, amen.